Welcome to Books of Our Time, produced by the Massachusetts School of Law and seen nationwide. Today we shall discuss a 2004 book on procedural reform in the U.S. Congress and the meaningfulness or meaninglessness of such reform. The book is entitled On Capitol Hill, The Struggle to Reform Congress and Its Consequences, 1948 through 2000. Its author is Julian Zelliser, a political historian who teaches at Boston University and in 2004 also edited a book on the history of Congress entitled The American Congress. Professor Zelliser is with me today to discuss on Capitol Hill, and I am Lawrence Aravelvel, the Dean of the Massachusetts School of Law. Julian, thank you for being here. Thanks for having uh, I, me. I've often, I've often commented at the beginning of the show, Julian, I thank people for coming up from Boston, I think from New York, Los Angeles. I thank you for coming three blocks. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pleasure. <laughs> Wasn't very far. Uh, Julian, you have written uh, as we discussed just before the show started, a number of books uh, dealing with Congress and congressional history. And uh, you're only 35 years old, and uh, these books are being or have been published by, what, well, Yale, Princeton, Harvard, Cambridge, and Houghton Mifflin. Not bad for somebody my age, and not achieved by many people my age, and here you are, 35 years old. Uh, and this book is one in this series of books on Congress. And in the book on Capitol Hill, you talk about a huge number of subjects. Uh, the diminution in power and importance of committee chairmen. Uh, the rise of new centers of uh, power and new institutions affecting power. Uh, whether uh, procedural reforms really have an effect substantively and so forth. What is your book really all about? What are the subjects, which subjects would you have stress most in your books, in, in the reader's mind, and uh, you know, why don't you just hold forth on that general series of points? There's two big stories, I think, that I tried to tell in the book. And the first was about how Congress as an institution changed pretty significantly in the 1960s and 70s, and how what I've called the committee era Congress came to an end. Mm -hmm. And it was a very uh, distinct Congress and the way it worked and the norms and the relationship between members of Congress and members of the median Congress. And this all came to an end in the 1960s and we entered a new period in congressional history which we're still in today. So one story in the book is how did we get to the place we are today? The Congress we see on TV, the Congress we saw impeach Bill Clinton, the Congress we've seen handle the war in Iraq, uh, how did we get there? And I, I say it's rooted in the 60s, 70s. And the second story is about American conservatism. And it's a story about how liberals tried to reform an institution in the 1960s, Congress, to make it more open, to make it uh, more progressive, to make it more partisan. And ironically, the reforms they put into place were used much more effectively by conservatives, by the conservative movement. Uh, and part of the conservative rise to power is how they mastered the ways and means of Congress. Uh, the ways and means of the legislative process. Would you say that the procedural reforms in Congress have in some senses come to naught because for every reform, if I may put it this way, there grows up a counteraction to stifle that reform or to overcome the reform or substantively to keep in place the, the, the uh, policies which some reforms were designed to overcome? Well, part of the book shows that actually reform can change the way an institution like Congress works. And a lot of the things that reformers wanted did work, and they continue to do what they wanted. For example, reformers in the 50s and 60s, liberals like Hubert Humphrey, senator, uh, wanted a more partisan Congress. They believed that partisanship was good, and that if we had a more partisan Congress, we'd get more things done, and we'd have a more uh, united body that can push forward legislation. And Congress is much more partisan than it was in the 1950s. Yeah, yeah. Uh, another second example, reformers wanted a more open system. Yeah. They wanted more information available about who gave money to legislators, where do yeah. campaign contributions come from, more should be on television, yeah. there should be less secrecy. And I think if you look at it, uh, politics today is, with all the problems, much less secret, much less insular yeah. than it was in that period. So reforms can work. Yeah. I was fascinated, even, uh, it didn't totally escape me in your that you had mentioned partisanship right at the beginning and then you elaborated on it later. That's really contrary to what people of my generation grew up with as the uh, supposed desideratum, which was that 
uh, there's, we're supposed to uh, uh, moderate. People are supposed to reach compromises. I'm really quite surprised to hear that people like Humphrey, I guess one would say, had more or less given up on that and just decided, well, if we have partisanship, we'll get liberal, uh, liberal laws. Yeah, well, if you think about it, in the 1950s and 60s, the Democratic Party was deeply divided. You had Southern Democrats and yeah. Northern Democrats. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the way Congress worked is it facilitated compromises between those two regions, within yeah. the Democratic Party and with the Republican Party. Right. And a lot of bills during that period were the result of backroom compromises by committee yeah. chairmen. Yeah. So yeah. for a lot of young liberals who came up in the 40s and 50s, yeah. these kind of compromises were stopping things like civil rights from yeah. ever taking yeah. place. Yeah. So the idea was, yes, compromise was not necessarily yeah. Yeah. a good thing, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that we wanted uh, a move away from compromise, yeah. not bipartisanship, partisanship. All right, I'm going to come back to that after we get to because that's of the essence in, in many ways. But uh, t t tell me, uh, Julian, why did you write this book? I mean, what is its fundamental purpose? And who are you trying to reach? Well, I, I try to reach as broad an audience as possible. I obviously write for uh, fellow scholars and students uh, in the classroom. There's a lot of detail in it, so the fellow scholars cannot fault you for any lack of detail. That's true. For lack of facts. That's Proof. true. Yeah. That's true. Uh, I've been fortunate that I've been reviewed and talked about in media outlets who are interested in yeah. politics, and that was one of my audiences. And I am interested in my writing to reach general readers who want serious history. Serious yeah. history about politics, yeah. not partisan history, which yeah. is so common today, I think, in the media, who really want to understand how our government works. Yeah. And so I try to hit all three uh, audiences in, in, in different ways. Yeah. Um, and so Has there ever been, Julian, I, I know you yourself have written or edited or co-edited, I think, four other books. Yeah. Has there ever been a book, uh, well, I have two, uh, two questions. A, has there ever been another book like this and B, in view of the fact that this book discusses a lot about the mechanics of the political system, when did writing about the mechanics of the system begin? There is no comparable book to it. Uh, political scientists have written a lot about the mechanics, but their writing is very different. It tends to focus on one single issue, uh, such as the filibuster, mm -hmm. and give a very detailed history of how the mechanics work. And political scientists are primarily interested in why, what motivates legislators. Mm -hmm. uh, what's mm -hmm. the real reason behind their support for reform or antagonism toward reform? Yeah. This is the first book that tries to give you a sweeping history of how all these reforms related and what was the big picture. Yeah. Uh, how was Congress changing or not changing mm -hmm. yeah. during this 1970s period? And it's the first book that goes all the way back to the 40s. I start it really in the World War II period, yes. and I take it not just through the 70s, but through today, or through at least the end of the 20th century. Yeah. Uh, and it was the only book to do that. Uh, yeah. And I'm one of the few historians, unfortunately, yeah. who has written about Congress with the tools historians bring to the yeah. table. Yeah. You know, I'll tell you a little story, which is by the by, and then I ask another question. I, I went to the University of Kansas Law School to teach mm -hmm. in 1966. And I had been in Washington for three years, and I'd spent a little bit of time on the Hill, about half a year. And I had written an article, which I submitted to the Kansas Law Review to have published. And I, in the article, I, I pointed out that uh, committee reports often are not written by any members of the committee or their staff, but by outsiders. Well. They were kind of, well, how do you know this? Where do you find this in the writing? I lived it. <laughs> yeah. and that kind of stuff was just part of the mechanics of how Congress was. Everybody had this civics textbook view of Congress, and still do to a large extent. And you know, finally they accepted what I said since I had lived it, but you know, it was a staggering thing to me that they didn't believe this could possibly be the case. All right, so, so, so be it. Uh, how do you compare the book with, say, uh, the 2000 book? a 2004 book that you edited, which goes through the entire history of co Congress, partly chronologically, partly by subject matter, partly the two things are, as the lawyers say, inextricably intertwined. Mm -hmm. How do you compare the two works? Well, the book that I edited on the history of Congress covers the entire history. Uh, the edited book starts with the founding of the country and goes through today. And it covers uh, many issues that I don't cover in this book. You mm -hmm. know, what was the effect of women's suffrage on the way, uh, mm -hmm. in the history of Congress? Uh, what the, the direct election of senators, how does that change the institution? So my book on Capitol Hill is almost a small part 
of that big book that I yeah. edited. And this is also a much more nuanced yeah. look yeah. at the institution. I can get into personalities like a Wilbur Mills or a Richard Bowling who were important in the 60s and 70s in a way I couldn't in a big yeah. sweeping book. Yeah. Uh, so it's really two different works yeah. for two different yeah. kinds of audiences. Yeah. The other one is if you want to picture the whole thing from start to finish uh, and you want fun chapters, short fun chapters yeah. on different, different periods and different yeah. issues. This yeah. is if you really want to know this post-World War II history yeah. Yeah. In, in depth and, and yeah. solidly, this book is, yeah. is what is better. Yeah. So th in that way, they're, they're separate. But the thinking is the same. I mean, yeah. in both books, I'm fascinated with procedure and the importance to Congress. I'm also fascinated with trying to place Congress in broader history. So this book does a lot of trying to explain the relationship between civil rights and yeah. the 1950s Congress, and not just looking at it as an insular institution. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I read the last few hundred pages of the other 2004 book, and uh, I think your description of the uh, similarities and differences is, uh, is right on, as one would expect since you wrote one and edited the other. Uh, Julian, let me ask you a question which disturbs me. Uh, you point out in the book, and you know, having lived through it, one sort of notices as, as it goes along, but one doesn't really get a good uh, capsule view over the course of four or five decades. Uh, you point out that often there have been procedural changes, changes in the mechanics of how the Congress operates, the filibuster being one example, but only one of many. Uh, I find myself wondering, and I'm curious to know what your, what your uh, view or response is to this. I find myself wondering whether what we should be focusing on are the kinds of people who are in Congress and, for that matter, in politics, because no matter what procedural reforms have been uh, implemented, it seems that uh, the polls find new ways of getting around it. If they're uh, conservatives, they find new ways of stopping their legislation. Uh, if they're liberals, well, they haven't had much success since the 1960s, perhaps. But you know, they find new ways. They found a way in 1987 uh, or 8 with a Bork nomination, of course. Um, shouldn't we be focusing more, or is there nothing we can do? about the kinds of people who get involved in politics and go to Congress and go into the executive branch? I think they're both important questions. I mean, one set of questions focuses not really just on technical things, but the way democracy works. Uh, one of the things, a big question, if you go back to the founding, if you look overseas at Iraq today, is democracy is a very abstract word. And one of the questions is, how do you make it work? How do you make it work on a daily basis? How do you produce legislation such as the Civil Rights Act? Uh, is it different to have an insular kind of political system and an open one? And those are important questions, I think, regardless of who's in the institution. And they have big effects on the way in which we experience American democracy. The other question is good, too, in terms of who goes into politics. And I don't know, you know how you affect that. Uh, some would say the process deters some people today from going into politics. That a more partisan process, scandal in politics, says many people say, I don't want to get involved. Yeah. Uh, others say, you know, overall we have pretty good people in Congress yeah. and we yeah. focus on the uh, bad apples too much. Yeah. Uh, so there's two different issues, I think. Well, I agree. Uh, I will ask one other question before I'm then going to move on to the committee system. Uh, Julian, in your book, uh, I counted. You know, one tends to lose sight of the numbers over the course of 280 pages. Mm -hmm. But I kept putting down names and I ultimately counted, and uh, this will be put on the screen, the names will be 32 people who from the 60s onward, and mainly the 70s and 80s and 90s, 32 people who were senators or congressmen, and in one case, a legislative aide, Bobby Baker, who is uh, Johnson's aide, have been the subject of scandal. Either they uh, committed crimes, or they acted unethically, or they were on the take, or they were engaged in, uh, you know, sexual escapades, and they got thrown out of Congress, or they got stripped of, uh, or they went to jail in some cases, like Rostenkowski, or they got stripped of, uh, of, commi of uh, committee chairmanships. You know, one would think, what is this, the mafia? You know, and it's the national legislature. I mean, what are we supposed to think or do about that kind of thing? And those are the, just the ones I mentioned. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Uh, well, look, part of what happened is after the 60s and 70s, there's an effort to bring out bad behavior uh, more than before. Uh, so part of why we get more scandal 
in the public arena in the 60s, 70s is because of the reforms. They wanted to codify ethics. They wanted to make certain rules uh, that everyone had to abide by. And it trapped many. And so we heard more about what was going on behind the scenes. More people got punished or more people got put in the public eye yeah. uh, for things that before were commonplace, no one cared about. Uh, so one answer is that that's actually a sign that reform can do things. We start to know more. We might not like it about the bad things that go on in our political yeah. process. Interesting, Julia, because what you're just saying, just to just sort of re simple-minded reiteration, is, yeah, well, these bad things are always happening. Yeah. Suddenly they know about it. You know, when I was on the Hill for just a few months in 1966, I'd come home. I'm not going to mention names. <laughs> I was on the same hall with some senators who, were, who chased every skirt that moved. And I'd come home and I'd tell my wife that this is, what are you talking about, you know, friend, what are you talking about, you know? Well, now we know, now we know. Uh, you said early on, and it's, it, it's uh, prevalent throughout the book, that the question of the committee system, its rise and fall, but really its fall, or decline at least, uh, is a major subject of your book. Tell us, how did the committee system come into existence how did Congress operate before there was a committee system? Well, let's start with those. Look, the commi committees have been in Congress since the early 19th century. By the 1820s and 30s, Congress starts to form committees to handle work, meaning small groups that are given uh, power over certain issues, such as taxation, over war. But it's really in the 20th century that the committee system becomes the central way in which both the House and Senate work. I mean, committee chairmen were the focus of power, uh, and they didn't really have to listen to their party leaders after the 1920s and 30s. And now, how did, they, how did they become the focus of power? What, what changed? What happened? What rules were passed that made them these very powerful people? Part of it was the natural weakening of parties in American politics. Parties were much stronger in the 19th century than they had been in the, tw in the mid 20th century, at least through today. So as parties weakened, other sources of power stepped in to fill the vacuum. Now, and let me Congress, see if I can understand. Committee chairs were important. Let me see, uh, let, let, let me uh, be a lawyer here, make yep. sure I understand it exactly. You're saying that when parties were uh, important, more important, they exercised influence. Mm -hmm. And you had some people in the center of the party at its head, or very powerful in it, the congressional elements of the party, so what the party decided is what went, because the party was so influential. And what individual Congress uh, committee chairman might have thought was uh, not of no never mind or certainly of less consequence. Is that correct? Absolutely. So uh, the head of a party in the 19th century or today in the, you know, ninth, in the 2000s will often uh, threaten or actually punish a committee chairman who doesn't do what the party wants. Yeah. But during this period, committee chairs in the 30s, 40s, and 50s felt a free hand to not listen to the party leaders. They didn't really care on certain issues. You know, that brings up a question which I skipped and I'm going to skip, but I hope we have time to come back to it at the end, which is the question of proportional representation and party power in those systems in Britain, Israel, Canada, you know, you name it, Germany, you, you, you name it, France, uh, the Scandinavian countries, Italy. Um, okay, I take it that uh, you would think that because there's so much to be learned, we need a committee system, and that therefore the uh, only uh, question is the extent of power uh, accruing to the committee. Now, how, how did, uh, what was the effect on the country? if anything, when the committee system was at its zenith with powerful chairmen uh, operating, as it were, their own fiefdoms? Look, that depends who you ask. But for many liberals in the 1950s, it was a negative effect. Uh, that what happened is these committee chairs who not only had their own fiefdoms, but they operated in secrecy pretty much. They had all the power of staff. There was no television. There was no C-SPAN, they could take a bill like civil rights and say, civil rights is not coming up for a vote. Civil rights is not going to pass. Or we'll put so many rules on this civil rights bill that it will be impossible to ever get through. So for many liberals in the 1950s, the effect of this was to stop the country, to stop the government from moving forward. 
it was stuck in the 19th century on many issues, and that if you had this system, they said, it undermined kind of the vibrancy of America. And that was the central critique that many liberals said uh, resulted from this. All right, we have to take a break. When we come back, we're going to start with the question of how did the, uh, what was the effect of the seniority system on all of this and on the uh, fact, if it is a fact, that so much power accrued to the South for so many years. We'll be right back right after this public service announcement. Stay with us. inquisitive kids are. That's why you store sharp objects in a safe place, keep medicines out of reach, and if you have a gun, you keep it unloaded and locked away. As concerned members of the television community, we urge you to be just as careful with television. Kids don't always know what they're watching. That's why you should. Hello, my name is Arthur Broadhurst. I am a graduate of the Massachusetts School of Law's first class in 1990. I've practiced law in both Massachusetts and New Hampshire, and my law firm is called Broadhurst to be. I also served in the Massachusetts House of Representatives for 14 years. What made this possible? I was among the first graduates of Mass School of Law. We were devoted, dedicated, and ambitious people from all walks of life who wanted to learn and practice law. Many of my classmates are now successful attorneys some are even law professors. Because of my gratitude to Mass School of Law, I am a trustee of MSL, and I'm also a trustee of MSL's new American College of History and Legal Studies, called ACHLS. ACHLS will give you an opportunity to be among an initial group, just like my classmates and I were at MSL over 20 years ago. American College of History and Legal Studies is an undergraduate college located in Salem, New Hampshire. ACHLS will give you a rigorous education that will enable you to do well in many fields. It also offers pathways into law school. ACHLS offers a bachelor's degree in history and legal studies. All classes are taught using the combination of the discussion method used at MSL and Harkness table method from Phillips Exeter. ACHLS will teach you to think, write, and speak well. Be a part of the inaugural class at American College of History and Legal Studies and start your future like I did at MSL. To apply and find out more about generous tuition scholarships, go to www.achls.org or call today, 603-204-3919. That's 603-204-3919. Thank you and I hope to see you all on campus soon. Welcome back. Julia, uh, the question on the floor was, what was the effect of the seniority system uh, in uh, placing the power in Congress pretty much in the hands of the South? Seniority was central to the uh, power of Southerners during the committee era Congress. Seniority is basically a system whereby if you stayed in office long enough, you moved up the ladder on a committee, so you eventually became chairman. Didn't matter if you were competent, didn't matter if you were loyal to the party, uh, and you just had to stay in office. So for Southerners, that was beautiful, because the South was a one-party state, uh, and it was safe seats were uh, very common in that region. It was easy to win re-election, so a lot of Southerners just moved up. So what you had was by the mid-20th century, Southerners had an inordinate amount of power uh, in this country, in part because of their hold on this committee uh, system. Why was this, when was this a seniority system 
put in place and why? It's never put into place. It's a norm. It's not a rule, meaning it's a custom that's really adopted at the turn of the 20th century. Oh. And the major reason it starts is people are staying in office longer. In the 19th century, people would come in and out of Congress. But by the 20th century, it's becoming a vocation. Yeah. People are going into Congress and staying for long periods of time. Uh, so in part, it's a way uh, to rationally kind of distribute power in the institution, rather than with every single person deciding, you know, what should your ranking yeah. be? They said, well, you'll just move up. Yeah. Two, it was also belief in expertise during yeah. the early 20th century. The idea is if you're in Congress longer, you learn more. And yeah. so you don't have to start fresh every time uh, with someone on a committee. Yeah. Uh, so you gain knowledge. And that was yeah. the second. And, but it also became a tool of power. Yeah. Because if seniority was what determined how high up you were on a committee ladder, it didn't really matter if you followed everything the party wanted. Yeah. Uh, and that was crucial. In the South, as you, I think, mentioned briefly, the South was essentially a one-party, it's always been a one-party section of the country, at least since the Civil War. At first, the party called itself Democrats, and now it calls itself Republicans. But, uh, you know, it was one party, and those folks just stayed around forever. Why did, the, why did people from the North, for lack of a better phrase, put up with that? I mean, it stopped civil rights cold. Let's start there. Absolutely cold until the first stirrings, and that's all you can call it, really, in Congress in 1957. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess it was good, f uh, it was good for some uh, social welfare economic legislation because the Southerners in Congress helped Roosevelt with the New Deal, but uh, on the other side of it, it was terrible for labor matters, and labor was a very big influence in the 30s and 40s and even into the 50s in this country. Well, all the people whom this harmed, why did they put up with this? Right. Why did, why did the Northern Democrats accept the Southern Democratic power? Uh, part was presidential politics. You know, until the 60s, Democrats counted on the South to put their men in office. And uh, that was very important. It's not really until the Civil Rights Act of 64 that you have a president like Johnson saying, well, if I give up the South, so be it. Okay. Uh, part was that old Northerners basically accepted the system. Even though Southerners were very powerful, there were Democrats who gained Northern Democrats who were also influential. Emanuel Seller yeah. is a Democrat from New York who really learns that old system. So he doesn't want to blow it apart either. Yeah. And finally, there's the fact that other than civil rights and labor issues in the South, Southerners weren't that unified. So until the 50s or 60s, being a Southerner didn't necessarily mean being conservative. Southerners not only supported the New Deal, they were behind agricultural programs, they were behind poverty programs, so they were a diverse lot. Part of what happens is civil rights makes the Southerner a conservative, and it kind of changes the political equation for many Northern Democrats. Yeah. who all of a sudden say, we can't have them in the party anymore. We can't have them have, have so much power. Yeah, yeah. What was the role in, in curbing the power of committee chairman? What was the role of subcommittees and subcommittee chairs? Uh, very important. Uh, in 1973, one of the big reforms that's passed is called the Subcommittee Bill of Rights. And what the reform does is it disperses power to subcommittee chairmen. So each committee has subcommittees. And all of a sudden, because of these reforms, these subcommittee chairmen had more power over legislation. They had more staff. They had more rights in terms of how the committee was going to operate. So the committee chairman in 73 lost a significant number of power to subcommittee chairs. So what it's scattered powers were, power. What powers were we given specifically to subcommittee chairs? For example, more power over staff, which is an incredibly important thing yeah. in Congress, yeah. given the number of issues people deal yeah. with and yeah. the role of staff. There was also more rights in terms of a subcommittee was guaranteed that they could at least look at certain bills. Uh, whereas before, often committee chairmen would just... Could they amend the bills? Yes, in, in certain cases. Could they refuse to report the bill out to the full committee? The subcommittees? Yeah. In certain cases, I believe. I'm not sure on that one. And, and, uh, but they had a, ro a role in shaping it. Yeah. And they had staff Morse. members who would study the problem. And so for the first time, they would know something. And about in it. some cases, they simply were granted the right to exist. Uh, one of the famous chairmen of the committee of Congress was Wilbur Mills, guy from Arkansas, chairman of the Ways and Means Committee in the 50s and 60s. And he just abandoned subcommittees altogether when yeah. he was chairman. He didn't yeah. even allow them to form. Yeah. And one of the reforms uh, that takes place is that subcommittees are formed on the Ways and Means Committee. Yeah. So again, the chairman is not quite as powerful anymore. Yeah. Now, uh, Wilbur, the name Wilbur Mills brings up the question of scandal. Yeah. Uh, let me say that, you know, 
being uh, almost a nonagenarian these days, <laughs> not really, but um, I remember Wilbur Mills very well. And it was said that Wilbur Mills was the only man in the United States who understood every jot and tittle of the Internal Revenue Code. And if you had a question about the code, Wilbur Mills was the man who had all the answers. Now, he got enmeshed in a huge scandal, uh, which leads to the question of what was the role of scandal in producing reform? When did it produce procedural reform in Congress? When did it not? Scandal in the 70s was incredibly important to producing reform. One of the things that happened in the 70s is you have a kind of movement that's pushing for reform constantly, it's pushing to change Congress, to change the primary system. And there's uh, interest groups in place, legislators in place, all ready to pounce. So that when a scandal broke, there were people there in the 70s ready to take advantage of it. And there was a belief that scandal wasn't important in itself, but it should be used to improve the system. So when Wilbur Mills, chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, uh, gets caught in an affair with a stripper from Argentina named the, uh, the Argentinian firecracker, uh, <laughs> quickly Democrats move to use that to reform the Ways and Means Committee. Yeah. Not only do they remove him from power eventually, yeah. but they also do what we said. They create subcommittees. They weaken the power of the chairman. And again and again, you saw reform in the 70s. It's very different than today, being used as a tool to change the institution. It yeah. wasn't simply they wanted the scandal in themselves. Yeah, yeah. Today they simply talk about maybe getting rid of Trent Lauder or Tom DeLay as a chairman or whatever their positions are. Yeah, and I think that's part of the change that happened. I mean, as the 70s faded, you entered into an era when that whole infrastructure pushing for reform fades. Yeah. And you have a few groups, scattered yeah. groups, but yeah. there's nothing yeah. big. And so when scandals happen, yeah. nothing comes out of it anymore. Who, who were the big names in the 50s and 60s who came into Congress, Julian, and decided that they wanted to see Congress change? One who I mentioned already is Hubert Humphrey, senator from Minnesota. Before he's vice president, he's known as a bomb thrower. Yeah. Uh, one of the first things Humphrey does in 1948 is he makes a speech at the Democratic Convention, and he says, Southerners, if you don't want to be in the party, leave. Yeah. Uh, bold move for a young Southerner. And he'll continue to fight for filibuster reform. Another is Richard Bowling, a Democrat in the House from Missouri yeah. who loves the institution, studies the institution, very brilliant, also arrogant, aloof, People hate him and respect him, yeah. and he would spend his whole career through the 70s uh, and early 80s fighting to change the way the House worked and to break the power yeah. of committees. Yeah. One other I would mention is Phil Burton, Phil Burton from California, also not a very likable fellow, tough, drinking, smoking, yeah. nasty guy, but he really believed that parties should be stronger, yeah. and he fought for that. He really fought against this old form of Southern power. Was, uh, was uh, Burton one of those... Uh Congress people who got killed down in South America uh, when they were going to visit uh, some group. I'm embarrassed to say, but I can't remember how his life came to an end right now. Yeah, okay. Uh, I have so many figures, sometimes I forget yeah. their whole life yeah, story. Yeah, well, there's only been several thousand of them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, now, uh, Humphrey was a bomb thrower yep. on behalf of civil rights. Mm -hmm. What was the overall impact of civil rights on the reform procedurally of Congress from the years, say, 1955, roughly, to roughly 1965? It was central. I don't think congressional reform would ever have become that of important of an issue if it wasn't for civil rights. Uh, one of the things that reformers inside and outside of Congress said is that civil rights was impossible to obtain if you didn't reform the way the institution worked. And they said, these procedures that are boring, that don't excite most people, have to be changed and have to be understood because they are absolutely central. So the NAACP, for example, listed filibuster reform in 1951 as equally important as ending lynching. Yeah. So this word cloture ranked with ending lynching. And that's how important the issue became. Yeah. Uh, there's another famous cartoon that's published in 1961 by Herblock. And when Kennedy was elected, there was a lot of expectations about what John F. Kennedy would do as president. But everyone said, if you don't reform Congress, you're never going to get civil rights. You're never yeah. going to get the new frontier. And the cartoon depicted uh, Kennedy standing before a gate, Mark, the new frontier, being blocked by a big, angry bull. Yeah. And one of the bull's horns said, House Rules Committee. Yeah. And the other said, Senate filibuster. Yeah. And that was the connection they made between the yeah. civil rights issue yeah. and procedure. Explain the Rules Committee and... Howard Davis, Judge Davis, 
uh, and uh, what its impact was on civil rights, so, which is what caused this connection to be made. Yes, Howard Smith, uh, who Howard is Smith, the chairman of the uh, House Rules Committee. That's a very important committee in the House that determines basically what rules a bill will be voted on, how, much lo how long it will have to be debated. Will it ever come on the agenda of the House? Can, and, I, can I interrupt yeah. you for a second? I have trouble with this myself, and I've been in Washington. But a rule, quote unquote, a rule, capital R, mm -hmm. in effect is uh, a, a statement of how long a bill can be debated, whether it can be amended, yep. and all the other procedural mechanics that will relate to that bill on the floor of the House of Representatives. Exactly. So, okay. so, so Howard Smith could either tack on a rule to a civil rights bill, or he could say that, that would make it hard for it to ever be passed, or he could just say it's not coming on the agenda this year. Yeah. Not coming on. And Howard Smith, who becomes chair in 1955, does this all the time. Uh, he frustrates liberals, especially on civil rights, but other matters as well. Frustrated me, I can He's talk. a southerner from Virginia. Uh, grew up in the house where his mother lived during the Civil War and fundamentally does not believe civil rights should be passed. Yeah. Uh, and he becomes really a center a focus for these reformers. Incredible example of how an older committee chair could really frustrate the ambitions of an entire party, an yeah. entire nation, yeah. in their minds. Yeah. And, and so he was a focus of reform in 1961 when reformers are able to expand his committee and place more liberals on the committee. Uh, which helps them gain the votes they need to pressure Smith. So in 1966, in a, in a, he's redistricted out of, out of office, which is another part yeah, of the story. Yeah, yeah, we'll get to that. But in effect, what they did, if I understand this correctly, is uh, they put more liberals on his committee and he was outvoted. Yeah, more liberals and one extra uh, moderate, two liberal Democrats, one moderate Republican. So they expand the committee, and that really uh, hurt. Yeah. He had a block of votes, yeah. Republicans and Southerners, that he depended on. And so they were able to pass that in 1961. And yeah. it was quite important, not just the, the reform, but symbolically. It yeah. showed that someone like Howard Smith in 1961, the guy who ran the place, could be defeated. Now, not to belabor it, well, let me belabor the obvious. It's become obvious from what you said. Through the seniority system in both the House and the Senate, and through the power of the chairman of the House Rules Committee in the House, who dictated whether a bill would come to the floor and under what conditions it would be considered on the floor, through those two mechanisms, uh, the nation was ruled. It was pretty important. Uh, and on smaller issues, uh, not smaller issues, but in taxation, yeah. Wilbur Mills used to get a rule from Howard Smith, yeah. as an example, saying that the Ways and Means Committee bills, bill dictating your taxes, could not be amended on the yeah. floor. So when it came to the floor, if you're a legislator from Massachusetts, you could vote yes or no, yeah. but you couldn't try to amend it. Yeah. And Howard Smith and Mills set that alliance for big issues, tax cuts, tax yeah. increases. Yeah. That's the way Congress ran for many years. Just to make a point that flows from that, even somebody like Wilbur Mills, who was one of the uh, powerhouses of the day, of the decade, in the uh, House of Representatives, even he had to play ball with Howard Smith, or his bills weren't going to get on the, on the floor, or weren't going to get on the floor under the kinds of conditions he wanted them considered under. Absolutely. They worked together. I mean, yeah. you had a, a fiefdom of a few chairmen uh, who, who had alliances, right. who worked together, and a lot of it, again, behind the scenes, right. uh, not, not scrutinized. What, what were different. the 1970s reforms, Julian? There's many. Uh, one reform is that the party caucus meaning the party, the, the body of Democrats and Republicans in the House and Senate, gain power to vote on whether someone should be a committee chair. It becomes a normal procedure. So every year they scrutinize who the chairman of the so committee they don't are. Like, if they don't like a Wilbur Mills or a Howard Smith, they vote them out. You got it. In 1974, they vote out Wilbur Mills. 1975, they vote out three of the most powerful chairmen. Uh, who were they? Uh, W.R. Pogue. Edward A. Bear and Wright Patman, okay, uh, who were right forced Patman. to come before the Watergate babies in 75 and yeah. say, why should you be chair? And they vote him out. Oh, this was you described as an amazing thing to their older people, 70 new guys, and they're saying, they're we don't want you anymore. They are stunned, yeah. and, uh, and it was a big moment. Another reform is to open up the process. So committee hearings are open to the public and to reporters, probably more important. You mean the committee hearings weren't open before? No, uh, most committee hearings were closed. Uh, openness increases dramatically in the 1970s. 
for the public doesn't know what you're doing. No, and, and re again, reporters, too, had much less access. They had to rely on uh, yeah. getting it from yeah. key staff. Yeah. Uh, you know, television is allowed into the chambers. Ethics rules are passed in 1977, which codify rules about a lot of things, which, again, before were allowed. How much income can you earn if you're a legislator by making speeches? And all of a sudden, in 1977... Now, what is the importance of that? Well, the, the idea was to clean up government. Uh, you wanted to limit the influences on legislators. So if they're going around speaking to interest groups, uh, making a lot of money, uh, that, that's not necessarily... You can't pay thing. somebody $50,000 to make a speech. You got it. And so, which is bribery, but please call it speechified. You got it. Yeah. And legislators will get caught in that, like Jim yeah. Wright and Newt Gingrich yeah. will get caught in those rules. Yeah. Uh, so those are more of the, this, the number of senators uh, needed to end a filibuster is reduced in 1975. That's seen as a big change. That's to 60 from 66. You got it. You got it. And that's, it's a small number, but in that's Senate politics, deal. it's a lot. That's a big deal. And so there, those are just some of, of the reforms. The one man, one vote ruling in the 60s from the Supreme Court ends population inequality in districts, congressional districts. What does that mean? That rural districts don't have more power than urban districts after the 1960s, which had been a major source of power yeah. for these Southerners yeah. who, who had votes from depopulated areas. Yeah. And, they, and, and so th there's tons of reform. I mean, it's really, uh, that's one of the remarkable things is that reformers in that period don't look at one issue. Yeah. They're trying to change the way the whole thing works. Yeah. So today you have McCain-Feingold, uh, the campaign finance, focusing on one issue, soft money and campaign. That's about the extent of reform in government. Yeah. This was a period when they were looking at the whole picture. And, and, a lot, and these are just some. The Subcommittee Bill of Rights is another thing that passes, yeah. all within the state of about seven, eight years. Yeah, yeah. We have to take another break. We'll come back and we'll discuss some more of these very specific procedural uh, affects upon Congress and within Congress. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Hello, my name is Anne Hemingway. I earned my Juris Doctorate degree from the Massachusetts School of Law in 2009. I currently practice law in Massachusetts. I also assist in bar exam preparation at MSL. I'm here to talk to you about the New American College of History and Legal Studies in Salem, New Hampshire, which is being created by the Massachusetts School of Law. The ACHLS offers a BA degree in History and Legal Studies to students who already have 60 college credits or an associate's degree. It is a completion college. It teaches the junior and senior years of undergraduate study. The ACHLS also offers guaranteed pathways into law school for those who wish to go on to law school and it likewise provides a rigorous education to others. It offers one half tuition remission scholarships of $5,000 to those who qualify. Tuition is $10,000 per year, but is only $5,000 for those who qualify for scholarships. The ACHLS has convenient evening programs that meet three nights a week. The college will be located right off of Exit 2, off of I-93 in Salem, New Hampshire. The American College of History and Legal Studies is a school where you can begin your future. So go to www.achls.org or call 603-204-3919. That's 603-204-3919 today to apply and to learn more about scholarships. You can also become a fan of ACHLS on Facebook or follow us on Twitter at Law and History. Thank you, and I hope to see you in class. The Massachusetts School of Law in Andover offers an accessible, affordable legal education to both full-time and part-time law students. When making admissions decisions, MS Law looks at all aspects of a candidate's qualifications and does not consider the flawed LSAT. At a tuition of less than half of all the other law schools in New England, it is by far the most affordable. Our teaching and standards are rigorous. Our students learn to think clearly, to write well, and to advocate effectively for others. Decide today to make a difference. Welcome back. Uh, you make the point, Julian, that not all the changes were within Congress itself. 
several came from outside of Congress. So let's start with what you call the rise of the adversarial media. What was that all about, and how did it affect the way Congress operates? The media before the 1970s tended to be pretty passive in how they covered Congress. There wasn't a lot of attention given to Congress, and there wasn't a lot of criticism of the way the institution worked. People like Lyndon Johnson had very close relationships with reporters like William White of the New York Times. Uh, Senator Joseph McCarthy took advantage of this. Uh, one of the things he did in his anti-communist campaigns was just say whatever he wanted, and he knew reporters would just quote him word for word without analysis, yeah. and it would get in the papers. But by the 70s, by the 60s, really with Vietnam, you have a new generation yeah. of reporters who emerge before Watergate who are determined to uncover corruption, uh, to tell readers how this place, Washington, is working behind the scenes, and who don't feel a connection to p politicians so much almost as a detest of politicians. And reporting by the late 1970s, by the mid-1970s, is focusing on these issues of corruption, of scandal, and they're very sympathetic to these questions of reform. Uh, and, and that would continue for several decades, a very different relationship uh, yeah. between the politician and the reporter. You know, as a historian, you will know only too well that uh, the American public did not really know that uh, Franklin Roosevelt was a, was a crippled person. Uh, nothing was said about John Kennedy's uh, uh, amours. It was a different press in those days. Mm -hmm. they, they were there, and so it wasn't confined to Congress. Right. It was everywhere. Everywhere. Yeah, yeah. And I, frankly speaking, and I know some people disagree with me, some people think Watergate was the great watershed. Mm -hmm. I say, not a chance. Vietnam, that changed everything because that's when Everybody said, hey, baloney, we've been, been handing, you know, they've been handing us a pile of baloney for years and years. Well, anyway. And, and you can see, I mean, it's, it's certainly the Vietnam period, and you can even see in coverage of Congress changes in the 60s. Before Watergate, yeah. there's scandals on Adam Clayton Powell, a guy in the House who gets also involved in various issues, income tax fraud, and yeah. Yeah. Thomas Dodd. Uh, who's a senator from Connecticut who gets yeah. implicated by the press yeah. in uh, using campaign money for his family yeah. and yeah. all kinds of issues. Yeah. And you see the change way before Watergate. Watergate's almost the culmination of this new generation of yeah. reporters. It yeah. doesn't start with Woodward and Bernstein. Yeah. Uh, that's really yeah, right. all of a sudden right. people realize, boy, this press has changed you know, yeah. significantly. You see what's happened over 10, 15 years already. Yeah, yeah. Uh, while this adversarial press arose uh, in the late 70s, there arose a very different kind of uh, coverage of Congress, C-SPAN. What was the effect of, how did C-SPAN arise, and what was the effect of C-SPAN in Congress? C-SPAN arises in two ways, that within the House and the Senate, the reformers are trying to open up Congress to the media. So there's a big push in 1977 in the House to say television cameras should be allowed in, in the chamber, and they finally convince Tip O'Neill to do that. So that has nothing to do with C-SPAN. This is kind of an interesting example of how different things come together. So in 77, O'Neill agrees to allow cameras in, but there's no one to cover. And part of, that's part of why he agrees to it. Okay. There's no sense of cable. There's no sense of C-SPAN. So it's not that big a threat. Yeah. 1979, a young he, guy... He would let him in, but nobody would come. That was his... TV didn't come. He was come. pretty confident. Yeah. Uh, who's going to cover this, you know... Yeah. And, uh, and C-SPAN forms by in 78 and 79. And even then, no, O'Neill isn't worried because there's no conception of cable being very important. They're, the idea was network TV. So he's an independent entrepreneur, Brian Lamb, uh, who is enthralled by satellite technology. And he forms this channel in 79, starts by covering the House. In 84, the Senate agrees. And initially, it's a very small station, yeah. uh, but it's motivated by this idea that opening government is a good yeah. thing in itself, yeah. that yeah. that actually can cure a lot of problems. Yeah. It, uh, when you would watch, if, if one would watch, uh, those uh, televised proceedings on the floor, I mean, you know, the old saying, it was like watching grass grow. But um, it was very misleading, wasn't it, Julian? Because as part of the uh, ag agreement for being let in, C-SPAN agreed that it would focus only on the dais. Yes. Well, they're pretending that there's an audience out there and the floor is empty. Right. And people have entire, in fact, there's a very funny story about how O'Neill, uh, why O'Neill uh, uh, ordered the cameras to pan once, contrary to the rules. Why don't you tell that story? Because it it's very indicative. And it shows how conservatives were taking advantage of these reforms. One of the things the young Republicans like Newt Gingrich do 
is they go on the floor every morning at the end of the day and they make these short speeches where anyone can get up and speak. Yeah. And they start making speeches attacking the Democrats for being weak on communism, for not giving money to anti-communist forces. And it looks like they're making a speech to the full house, but in fact they're the only ones there. Yeah. And by May, I think, of 84, <laughs> they're doing this and they're challenging Democrats. So they're saying, <laughs> You're weak on defense. Do you why don't you stand up and you got me? <laughs> you got it. So at one point, Tip O'Neill is so furious because they're attacking Eddie Bolin, yeah. who is one of his closest friends. They used to drive roommate. back and forth to Boston every weekend. You got it. Yeah. And, uh, and, and he gets so mad that he orders the cameras to pan. So viewers <laughs> see an empty chamber. Uh, yeah. But it actually becomes, even though, it, and so, and so the, it's exposed. Uh, but Republicans actually, those young Republicans, that's a key moment in their history because uh, despite what happens with the cameras, it gains them notoriety. All of a sudden, they're being co covered on New York Times. Yeah. TV Guide has a story on cam scam, as it was called. Yeah. And all of a sudden, people like Newt Gingrich are real powers. Yeah. And they use the technology quite brilliantly. Uh, and, and then they turn it against O'Neill because they say the rules are you can't pan the chamber. Look at this guy. He's just breaking the rules. Yeah. And, and it, uh, that's, that's a turning point in their history. But it's an amazing story uh, on, on, on how these reforms and how this new television uh, was being used by you know, conservatives. You know, if I may put it this way, it's a marvelous story for another reason because when you think about the spirit of the thing, these guys who were standing up and challenging the Democrats to respond when there, were no, there was nobody in the phone, they were cheating. They were, they were misleading the public, and it's a form of cheating by, because you're making everybody think, oh, there's people out there who are too weak uh, to respond to me when there's nobody there. And then they complain mm -hmm. because O'Neill breaks the rules because he pans to show that they're cheating. Right. I mean, this is Congress for sure. Uh, well, that's, that's a value judgment, isn't it? All right. It also, I mean, one of the things that happens with C-SPAN with cable television is that legislating becomes a television event. And one of the things you're seeing here is the ability to manipulate the camera, to appear before the camera in a certain way becomes absolutely essential if you want to be powerful. Yeah. And both Democrats and Republicans are starting to learn this, uh, how important that yes, is. Yes, and, and, and explain that now uh, legislators uh, rely on television to get uh, their face on the two back in their districts, explain how they have their own television facilities and so on and so forth. Oh, they vastly expanded their public relations, each member, not just the leadership, yeah. public relations staff. They're trained uh, to, to do television. Right. One of the other stories they tell They're is, trained. That's yeah. important. They're and trained. that goes back. Tip O'Neill, yeah. when he starts as a leader in the, in the mid-76 and 77, he hates TV. Yeah. He, won't, he rejects Sunday morning talk show invitations because yeah. he wants to go to the Cape. But by 1980, <laughs> when Ronald Reagan is elected, uh, he realizes if he doesn't do well on television, he doesn't appear uh, in a compelling way, he's not going to be effective. So he hires this young guy named Chris Matthews who uh, comes in and he teaches him how do you sit in front of a camera? How do you speak to the camera? How do you repeat points over and over so they work? Yeah. And Tip O'Neill remakes himself on television to the yeah. point he appears on the television show Cheers. Yeah. Uh, and he yeah. really turns yeah. into almost the Santa Claus figure by 84 yeah. and 85. Yeah. Whereas yeah. earlier yeah. he was depicted yeah. as this old machine yeah. type politician. Yeah. So yeah. that's, that's a one story of millions at this point. Yeah. And you can't really be a legislator without that skill right now. Yeah, yeah. What was the effect, Julian, of the rise of CNN and uh, the, its progeny, if you will, MSNBC, Fox News, uh, etc. I think it's uh, destabilized politics in Congress in many ways. First, it's, it's quickened the news cycle. Mm -hmm. So whereas the news cycle used to be an entire day, meaning a news story wouldn't appear till 7 o'clock, now news can go out instantly. Yeah. So if you're dealing with an issue, whether it's war, whether it's uh, welfare, whether it's taxes, the news can go out, you know, five minutes from the time you make a decision. And so you have to move much quicker. There's not a lot of time for negotiation anymore. Yeah. Uh, the second effect, I think, is it's made leaders more vulnerable. Uh, we've had an amazing number of prominent leaders since the 70s fall from power, including Newt Gingrich, who we've been talking about, Jim Packwood, Robert, Robert Packwood, Jim Wright, many others. Yeah. And I think part of that is because information, scandal information, can go out on the airways yeah. quickly. It's yeah. hard to control. It's yeah. hard to respond to. I think it's actually been a challenge. Uh, there was a comfort I think many politicians had from a slow news cycle, from the fact info didn't get to the public for a long time. Different atmosphere. You know, uh, speaking as a human being, 
Uh, in other words, I don't think this is confined to Congress. Mm -hmm. When you make a practice of responding instantly to new difficult and serious subjects without taking time to think about it, mm -hmm. a few days, a week or two, you are just going to make a fool of yourself time after time. That is my judgment. I may be wrong. Right. But at least that's my judgment. I mean, that has an effect on these people, too, does it not? They are saying things that are crazy sometimes, aren't they? Well, it captures the institution. The pace of thinking has to be much quicker, and that's not necessarily a good thing. There is not as much time for deliberation in the yeah. modern age. And with the Internet and email, it's accelerated all that much more, yeah. uh, in which you have to have instant responses, not just to television crews, but to email blitzes by interest groups or, or citizens. Uh, and so I think as an institution with hundreds of people that needs to try to find compromises in legislation that, that's going to yeah. last, yeah. it's not necessarily the easiest atmosphere yeah. in which to do that. And it's certainly, it, it's just way too easy to say things that make bitter enemies out of people whom you should be working with. Right. Yeah. And it, I mean, it's, it, you know, someone like Trent Lott got trapped by making a speech in a, a small yep. a convention that C-SPAN covers in which he talks about the 1948 election and, and, the, and its ties to civil rights, and boom, within a few days he's demoted. And that's how, yeah. that's how government is. Well, now. see, most of us thought he said what he, re he, he, said what he really thought. Right. Which is, right. you know, uh, I want to get back to some of this if we have time. But, before, but, but I want to switch to something else because it's so important and it's so generally unknown. Explain the effect of the budget process in Congress on what legislators are able to do, uh, how it works, and what its effect is. And you might want to go back even to the 50s and 60s and explain how it was then and then the changes. Because this, this is an extraordinarily important factor. In the 50s and 40s, the budget process, there was no congressional budget. It was basically handled, I don't remember the number, by about 13, 14, 15 different committees. Each had a piece of the budget. Yeah. The president would send over a proposal, and they would all kind of work on their individual issues and come back with what some thought was a mess. It was completely decentralized. Yeah. Uh, 74, 1974, there's a reform that tries to centralize the process. So there is now a congressional proposal for the budget. Just as the president proposes yeah. the budget, yeah. Congress will propose its own budget. And there are budget committees in the House and Senate which theoretically have influence over all the smaller committees. Yeah. So it basically centralized the process. Yeah. Uh, the other thing it did is the budget can't be filibustered in the Senate. That was incredibly important. Uh, that was one of the rules. The idea was let's centralize this budget. We'll propose our own budget. We'll have budget committees. And when it hits the Senate, it can't be filibustered, the yeah. kind of budget. So what's happened is uh, Congress has been more forceful in budget debates. And you saw that with the shutdown of the government in the mid-90s yeah. when Clinton and Gingrich yeah. uh, went into loggerheads. But also, more things are handled through the budget process yeah. Yeah. because it's a way around the filibuster. Yeah. But the budget mm -hmm. uh, limits people in the following way, doesn't it? I forget the figure. You, you tell us. Something like 60 or 70 or 80 percent of the budget is spoken for. Yes. It must be used in certain ways under pre-existing programs, which means you don't really have a lot of money to play around with. Why, why don't you explain that? That's a very big phenomenon in American politics uh, that we've had. Now we have almost, almost half of the budget is spoken for, as you said. So between Social Security, uh, between Medicare, between other kinds of, those are the two big ones. Fixed but expenses. But programs that are fixed expenses, Congress... Congressmen and women don't have a lot of room uh, to do things anymore. Uh, yep. And it keeps getting smaller and smaller. So one of the things that's happened is it's, in some ways it's weakened Congress as an institution. Because with all the fighting, with all the rancor, most of the things are already set. Yep. You know, yep. where spending is going to yep. go. Uh, another effect, some say, is it's made everything that much you know, more bitter. That because you have less to fight over, because you have $2 instead of $100 every year, those $2 become yeah. that much more valuable. Yeah. And so part of the acrimony that you see yeah. is a, frust it's a sense of frustration. You know, there's an old saying in the academic world that the reason academic right. fights are so bitter is that so little is at stake. Yeah. And I think you're saying the same thing here. We have to wrap it up. Julian, thank you very much for coming three blocks. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me. And for appearing on our show. Thank you. And, uh, and uh, I must say that the, your books are a real revelation, I would think, to most people because so few people know how the Congress has worked or does work today. And many of us think it doesn't. <laughs> but thank you very much. Thank you. To the audience, be with us again next time.